Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee for September 16th, 2019. My name is Philippe Cunningham, and I am the grateful chair of this committee. With me at the dais are Council Members Cano, Johnson, and Council Vice President Jenkins. Please let the re record reflect that we have a quorum and can conduct the business of this committee. Colleagues, we have quite a full agenda today of 15 items. We have um, two items under the public hearing. Um, we have uh, consent agenda and then two discussion items. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is go through the consent agenda and then we'll go back to the public hearing and finish out with the discussion. I would like to make a note at, um, prior to diving in that under the public hearing item number two, the small and underutilized business program applicability to con contractual amendments ordinance will be actually postponed until December 2nd. It says on the agenda um, October 7th, but it will be December 2nd. Um, because they are still doing some uh, additional work uh, around audits that is related to to this ordinance. So, um, but it was notified, so we will still open up the public hearing, but we will be continuing it to December 2nd. So let me go ahead and dive in into the consent agenda. Item number one is approving the council appointment of Aaron Hurley, seat 20, Ward 7, for a two-year term to the Public Health Advisory Committee. Item number two is authorizing, excuse me, item number four is authorizing an agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, to host an associate from the Public Health Associates Program, PHAP, in the Minneapolis Health Department for two, a two-year period beginning October 15th of this year. I do wanna just make a quick pause here to point out that the uh, City of Minneapolis Health Department has hosted um, PHAPs for quite a few years now and um, with great results. Um, they are, I believe, graduate level students. Are they grad students? Yeah. Um, who are studying public health. And so I just want to share that as a result of uh, the, the health department's mentoring and providing meaningful work opportunities that the seven previous PHAPs have gone on to become an adolescent pediatrician, obtain advanced degrees in public health, and become CDC professionals themselves. So just wanted to give a shout out to the health department for their leadership and uh, because we know folks are good leaders when they produce more leaders. And so I uh, just want to make sure we named that. Welcome, uh, Vice Chair Gordon. No worries. Item number five is the passage of a resolution accepting a donation from the Robert Wood Johnson, Johnson Foundation for the uh, to for Patty Bowler to represent the health department at their roundtable on law and policy, uh, the September nineteenth through twentieth. Item number six is a passage of a resolution um, for a gift acceptance for travel-related expensive for Michelle Rivero to the Cities for Action Conference uh, national convening for immigration-related uh, for immigration related topic. Item number seven is authorizing the formal intervention of the city of Minneapolis as a party to the Excel Energy 2020 through 2034 integrated resource plan docket before the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission on or before November 1st, 2019. Item number eight is approving the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, NRP, plan modification process as recommended by the NRP Policy Board to direct all neighborhood plan modifications over $100,000 to be reviewed and approved by the NC NRP Policy Board. Item number nine is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health in the amount of $194,550 for enhanced blood lead testing, lead poisoning prevention efforts, and asthma ed education for the duration of August 1st of this year through June 30th of 2021. Item number 10 is accepting a grant from the D D Minnesota Department of Health in the amount of $3,919,128 for maternal child health services uh, for the duration of July 1st of this year through June 30th, 2023. Item number 11 is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health in the amount of $844,527 for the period of October 1st of this year through September 30th, 2020 for uh, maternal and child health efforts. 
Item number 12 is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health in the amount of $1,501,464 for the period of October 1st of this year through February 28th, 2022 for quality evidence-based home visiting services to improve health and developmental outcomes for children and families in selected at-risk communities as well as authorizing an agreement with the Department of Health in the total amount of $3,035,658. And the last item on the consent agenda is approving $74,309.25 of the remaining Hennepin County's second 7.5% neighborhood revitalization funds for the for social services through St. Stephen's to address homelessness along the Midtown Greenway. Uh, I just want to give another quick shout out to the health department for all of their um, hard work bringing in grants to the city to be able to ensure that uh, we're doing really impactful public health work. Do I would like to make a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. We're gonna go ahead and move back to the public hearings. Um, the uh, first public hearing that we have is uh, for the passage of an ordinance amending Title 10, Chapter 188 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to food code administration and licensing, adding a new section to create a micro wholesaler food license endorsement, allowing for the sale of qualifying retail food products through shelf space lease arrangements. And are you here today to present? All right, come on forward. If you say your name for the record, that'd be appreciated. My name is Nate Kelly. I am a health inspector with environmental health. And then hello, uh, Chair Cunningham and council members. The micro wholesaler license is a new affordable avenue for Minneapolis businesses, especially our small local startups, to expand their product availability in the Minneapolis marketplace. How this ordinance began is we had a small local business named Kay Baracho who had a successful empanada product that was sold retail at farmer's market and civic events. The vendor wanted to make the product available at local retailers. Under Minnesota Department of Agriculture state statute, wholesaling meat product is not allowed without an MBA license. Following new Minnesota Department of Agriculture guidelines, there, was, there were um, guidelines that were placed in this ordinance. Minneapolis can license small businesses to wholesale meat products to limited retail locations. Minneapolis licensed food retailers can rent shelf space to licensed micro wholesalers to have their product available to customers. Essentially, empanada, sambusa, tamale producers can sell directly to the consumer through other licensed food businesses. If the business becomes successful and wholesaling becomes larger than their retail sales, they would still need to obtain a Minnesota Department of Agriculture wholesaler license and discontinue this micro Minneapolis micro wholesaling license. Business licensing sent out a public notice for this ordinance change. We only received one response from Valine Rodriguez, the owner of Cape Racho, showing her support and need for this ordinance. We provided a copy of the letter for you today. And thank you, and with, with that, if you have any questions or comments. Great, thank you so much. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, thank you so much you. for that brief um, overview of this ordinance. I would like to now go ahead and open the public hearing for any comment. Is there anyone here? No one signed up? Okay, well, I'll just check. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Anyone? Well, we have the letter, so we have that one person who has spoken on it. So uh, seeing no one here to speak to it, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. I will move approval of this item. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and that item carries. <clears throat> So item number two under public hearing, again, I just, um, so I will be uh, making a motion to postpone this item to December 2nd, 2019, and then we'll be opening the public hearing and continue it to that date as well. So um, I will go ahead and first make that motion. So 
Uh, I make a motion to postpone this item to December 2nd, 2019. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that carries. I will now open the public hearing since it was noticed. Um, we are still, we are legally required to still open it even though this item is being postponed. Is there anyone here to speak on this item? All right, seeing no one here to speak on this item, I will continue it until December 2nd. Great. And we have two items for discussion today, colleagues. Um, the first is receiving and filing the Minneapolis Tree Advisory Commission 2019 report on the state of Minneapolis urban forest. Who do we have here to speak? Yay, please come to the, please come to the, um, microphone and say your name for the public record. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Peggy Booth and I am the chair of the Minneapolis Tree Advisory Commission. Let's see. Maybe I'll just move this over here. Um, oops. And at any rate, we're here today to present to you our annual report. And the overall theme of our annual report this year is healthy trees and healthy communities. Our report topics are trees provide important benefits. We're losing trees in Minneapolis, getting trees where they're needed the most, making it work, and recommendations. As you may know, the Minneapolis Tree Advisory Commission is appointed by the Minneapolis Park Board along with representatives of the City Council, Public Schools and Public Works. And I have with me here today our City Forester who is Director of Forestry within the uh, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and that's Ralph Sievert. So if there are any questions of a more technical nature, I will probably be asking Ralph to help out. So our first topic is trees provide important benefits. And trees in Minneapolis are the growing capital asset that benefits everyone in the city. They are multi-purpose environmental assets that are as much a part of the city's infrastructure as streets and storm sewers, providing important benefits to the environment, human health and well-being, community quality, and our property values and the quality of our properties. Uh, it's also as if with our public trees, we have a park in front of everyone's house. So each street tree saves us on average $100 uh, due to the environmental benefits of those trees. It is important as we think about trees to realize that tree value is determined by the amount of leaf volume that we have in trees. So the amount of benefits equals, in approximate terms, the amount of tree canopy cover. So we periodically refer to tree canopy cover as a good measure of do we have enough trees to provide the kind of environmental benefits that we want. And it is important to note that in the Minneapolis 2040 plan, policy number 14 is to improve the tree canopy and urban forest. So that is something that the city is recognizing through its new comprehensive planning process. Uh, Trees provide important benefits. Research shows that trees help reduce crime rates, calm people with ADHD, and speed up recovery of hospital patients. A few more interesting studies. In Sacramento, they found that areas with more tree cover had better overall health of the people that lived there and better social cohesion. Another study in California found that school children in, um, that live in cities in grades six to eight spend more time outside with physical activity when there is more tree cover. And I think that's particularly important as we realize that our children have an increasingly sedentary uh, life. And then another interesting study is that they found that with a 10% increase in tree canopy cover, the amount of low weight births, that is to say births that, um, babies that weighed less than they probably should to be fully healthy um, uh, happened. So more trees, bigger babies, healthier babies. So when we lose trees, we lose those benefits. And 
Um, as I think you are all aware, emerald ash borer is a devastating uh, insect that kills all green ash, white ash, black ash trees, and that it has been um, faced, many uh, communities in the eastern U.S. have faced devastating results. So this picture shows a street in Toledo, Ohio, before and during Dutch elm disease. And there was a study done that was published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine medicine that showed for counties in 15 Midwestern states affected by emerald ash borer, this does not include Minnesota because it was before uh, we had our greatest impacts, that deaths increased in those counties that had most impact by emerald ash borer, that there were additional cardiovascular related deaths as well as additional deaths related to lower respiratory disease. Finally, uh, trees provide important benefits um, for our economy. They help grow our tax base as it make our city more attractive and retain people and attract people and jobs to our city. So each year, street trees provide energy savings, reduce stormwater runoff, increase property value, and improvements to our air qualities. And there's an estimate that that is almost a 20 million total dollar value um, to the city every year of our trees. And so um, there's been calculations that, that for every dollar we invest in public trees, we get back a dollar 80 in benefits. The second topic regards the loss we are facing of trees. And the first thing I'm gonna be talking about is emerald ash borer. The losses are accelerating and it's now impacting most of the city. It was first um, observed in um, Cam Gordon's ward in Prospect Park, sorry Cam. Um, uh, in 2010, and so I will just flip through the neighborhood so you can see year by year how it has spread across the city. And I know that the neighborhood that I live in, uh, which is partly in Cam Gordon's um, ward, if I might just digress, I went by our, our school property there and there were there are right now 10 very large ash trees marked for removal at a school that's only half of a city block. And so that's pretty devastating. This map then shows with the black circles the additional neighborhoods that had not had confirmed cases of emerald ash borer in their neighborhoods uh, in 2018 that did as of the um, early in 2019. So um, the park board with the support of the Tree Advisory Commission is uh, adopted a ash canopy replacement plan, a process of slowing the spread citywide of emerald ash borer by detecting and removing uh, trees as well as proactively removing ash trees and replacing them. So this is a graph that was developed in Ohio showing how in the first years of emerald ash borer it's a fairly slow level of losses and then it accelerates dr drastically. So we are in year 10 of uh, the infestation in Minneapolis which is when we would normally be expecting to see whole uh, streets lined with um, uh, dead and dying trees. I think what we're seeing instead right now, for reasons I'll explain in a minute, is a great acceleration in the number of trees on private property. Um, so while we are losing trees, of the um, million trees in Minneapolis, 200,000 were estimated to be ash and 400,000 of these were estimated before emerald ash borer to be um, in public parks and in boulevards, public trees in parks and boulevards. Of these, as of the beginning of 2019, through the ash canopy replacement plan, 28,000 of these public trees have already been removed, both diseased ones and ones that, that we could more effectively remove now and replace with a diversity of, of tree species. So the fact is right now most of the ash, and these will all die unless they're chemically treated in perpetuity, um, are in private yards. All ash trees, that's black ash, green ash, white ash, all true ash trees are susceptible to emerald ash borer. Removal of untreated infested trees is mandatory. 
And it's not like Dutch elm disease. Elm trees, oak trees, some other trees will stand a long time when they're dead, but it's a physiological and innate characteristic of ash trees that as they die, they start falling apart. So large dying ash are likely to fall and may cause harm when they fall apart. This is an example on the block um, uh, near where I live where an ash tree fell down and damaged a car. So waiting until an ash dies is both more costly and more dangerous. So we think it's very important that property owners should know if they have an ash tree, know that emerald ash borer may kill it soon, and learn what their options are and make a plan. Uh, proactive ash removal payment strategy. The city is strongly encouraged to pass an ordinance which has been drafted and which has, um, I believe, been, been presented to help property owners remove trees during infestation. Due to emerald ash borer's serious threat, uh, property owners um, through this proposed ordinance amendment would be allowed to have an ash removed and to pay for that over time by having it put on the assessment. This is something that um, uh, people can do with elm trees um, that are diseased, but this is basically saying that property owners should be allowed to remove ash trees and pay them for them over time. In addition, and I don't believe that this is part of the drafted ordinance as yet, owners should be able to include the cost to replant a new tree if they so choose in that assessment as well. And that would help achieve that 2040 plan of, of improving our city's tree canopy cover. We're also losing large, significant trees, um, often um, times during development, because there is no protection. Many cities have tree protection ordinances, and this is something that the Tree Commission is looking at. So big trees right now, when we lose them, we lose their benefits. So how can we grow our city without destroying the trees which help us thrive? So we have two recommendations in this area. Um, one is that the um, uh, Park and Recreation Board, in cooperation with Public Works, um, has a forestry preservation coordinator that is in an acting um, situation. It is not a fully funded and appointed or, or hired position. This person works with Public Works and others to um, do plan review and make sure that public works projects and other projects are not unintentionally destroying trees. The position was funded in 2017 in part by the Park Board, but the city committed to funding but has not yet budgeted that funding so this per position can be made permanent. So we are recommending to the city and the Park Board to fully fund and permanently hire the Forestry Preservation Coordinator. This is essential to protect trees during public construction projects. Secondly, we recommend to the city that the city look at developing a tree protection and replacement ordinance. This is essential to protect large good trees during development, and I think we're seeing a lot more infill development, and there is more um, potential that as properties change use that large trees can uh, intentionally or unintentionally be destroyed. And we also feel that the city should require tree canopy replacement when loss is unavoidable. And that will help the quality of our city um, uh, continue to be good and attract more people and jobs. The next topic is getting trees where we need them most. Um, as I've alluded to earlier, trees give us healthier places to play as well as to live because they reduce skin cancer, filter air, keep us cool. So one of the things we are advocating is increased tree cover adjoining playgrounds and athletic fields. One of the things that the city and the park board do to achieve that is each year priority park is selected for Minneapolis Arbor Day. So in 2018 at Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Park over 150 trees were planted. In 2019 over in Theodore Worth Park over 300, 200 trees were planted and these are trees of a lot of diversity. And in each case, over 1,200 people participated in the event. 
we can still see with um, uh, um, mapping of tree canopy cover where the tornado went through North Minneapolis in 2011. So I wanted to brief the, the council on what has been done to um, help that neighborhood that was particularly impacted by loss of trees. The Park Board Forestry crews are commended for ongoing tree planting and care in North Minneapolis. And basically, we've gone on a tour with um, the district um, foreman there who says that at, at, at the time the trees were being planted this spring, all the tree planting places that could be planted um, were planted. So we think that's very amenable um, and commendable, excuse me. Um, but what's being done for tree equity and the fair distribution of trees throughout the city? Well, the Park Board is directly addressing this by prioritizing tree planting in target communities. So basically, highest priority for replacement trees is to lower income neighborhoods with higher racial diversity. And among those priority neighborhoods, those with low tree canopy cover get planted first. And currently missing um, street trees in the highest priority neighborhoods will be planted by next year. Of course, by that time we'll have lost some more trees. So it's always an ongoing challenge. To tell you how this works, they use maps um, uh, that identify areas where 50% or more of the residents are people of color or areas of concentrated poverty. And they combine that information with um, map data on the percentage of tree canopy cover. So the map on the right here, the darker colored neighborhoods have higher tree canopy cover. The lighter colored neighborhoods have lower tree canopy cover. And those two pieces of data are combined to develop lists of every neighborhood in the city and give it a priority uh, rank. And so here's a map that shows with the darkest color, the highest priority neighborhoods in the city in order to get more public tree planting. Uh, another aspect of getting trees planted where we needed most is last year we recommended that the, a forestry outreach coordinator position be created and uh, the park board did put it in funding for this year and it's in the process of getting filled and this will also help engage these um, priority tree equity uh, neighborhoods and seek more partnerships and volunteerism, including citizen pruners, and do more to involve youth in these neighborhoods. So our recommendation to the park board this year in this regard is to extend the tree levy for public tree planting and care. This is a special levy that um, was provided to the forestry division or forestry department within the Park and Recreation Board to remove and replace ash trees. But this um, funding expires uh, in uh, partway through 2021. And we feel it is essential to um, continue that increased funding for trees to protect the investments made to date, to keep up with the tree canopy vacancies and to continue this until we achieve that 40% tree canopy cover goal. Uh, the city tree program, which is funded by this, um, the city of Minneapolis and funded by the tree trust, works to increase canopy cover in private property because that's where our greatest potential is to create more tree canopy cover. They are using a lottery system now that allows more equity in access and the number of trees are balanced by city ward and price breaks are given for trees that will get big. In addition, the Tree Trust has worked with a group called the Autonomous Collective as part of an ongoing um, uh, effort to plant more trees in the area affected by the tornado in North Minneapolis. So for example, 256 trees have been planted through the Tree Trust and in cooperation with the Autonomous Collective in four parks and 75 homes. But the biggest problem for tree equity on 
private property is getting the agreement of rental property owners to say, yes, a tree can be planted on the property I own and I will um, uh, encourage care on it. So our recommendation to the city is to incentivize tree planting and care on one to four unit rental properties. I believe that this really would be consistent with the approach the city is taking of renters first because the health benefits, as I showed earlier, directly um, benefit the people that live in these properties and it is also necessary to achieve tree equity on rental properties. Our last topic is making it work. We need to support effective tree operations. The Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, when it plants trees in the spring, and for example, this year I think there were about 9,000 trees planted, um, needs a place to receive those trees from the, the companies that provide them and care for them until it's time to plant. And then again and again, the park board has been forced to find a new distribution site. This year in spring of 2019, uh, for the first time they used um, the site underneath the Washington Avenue Bridge on um, Bohemian Flats on the Mississippi River. And we are strongly recommending the park board that they permanently commit to uh, use that site to provide that care for the trees. The second topic under this overall theme of making it work is long-term plans for processing tree debris. The city does not, the city nor the park board does not have any permanent sites for processing routine tree debris. Tree debris, that's trees um, that are removed or get pruned. What happens to all that branches and wood? And also, if there is another tornado, or when there is another tornado, there isn't a place to process that um, uh, tree waste either. And this is very similar to the Public Works Department needs to have sites to dump excess snow. So we feel that the Park Board and the city should cooperate to locate sites that can be used for wood waste in the summer, of uh, snow in the winter and it would be a win-win for both the, the city and the Park and Recreation Board. Um, and right now this is a, a challenge that's really affecting our cost-effective operations for trees. So finally, a recap of our recommendations related to healthy trees and communities. First, increase tree canopy where needed most, extend the tree levy for public tree planting and care, and incentivize tree planting and care on one to four unit rental properties. Second, secure permanent uh, sites for tree processing, both for tree distribution sites by the park board and cooperation between the city and the park board to locate wood waste processing sites and perhaps in conjunction with snow removal processing. And finally, protect significant healthy trees by funding and permanently hiring the tree preservation coordinator. And we encourage the city to look at developing a tree protection and replacement ordinance. Uh, so with this, that's our annual report to you and I appreciate your time and attention and can take any questions or comments you may have. Great, thank you so much. That was deeply informative. I appreciate the thoroughness of it. Uh, I have a question or comment from Council Vice President Jenkins. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Wow, trees are pretty amazing based on your report. Um, and, and I certainly recognize the health benefits. I was, can you help me understand how trees help reduce crime? Uh, this is some studies that I think were done in Illinois and what they found, and, and these were um, scientific studies, is that neighborhoods that had trees and more green space had lower crime rates. And when they controlled for other variables, they found that areas that had trees, that looked like they were places that people liked to live, would have lower crime rate. If you're interested, I could find the citation on that study and, and get that to, to the council. Um, yes, I would, I would like to see that report. Okay. Um, and then the $19.5 million assessment, how was that determined? Okay, um, I believe that, that that was through a computerized um, 
a tree inventory called iTree that was done a number of years ago. Um, this is a program that was developed by an organization called American Forests and um, in cooperation, I think, with the U.S. Um, uh, Department of Agriculture, um, U.S. Forest Service. And so they have um, looked at different research studies to say what kind of value related to reducing stormwater runoff, uh, reducing energy use, and other kinds of quantifiable benefits of trees, how do they correlate with um, the amount of trees. So in that eye tree study, they were able to estimate the tree canopy cover through areas throughout Minneapolis and overall through for Minneapolis, and then using that other research, turned those um, number of tree. Ralph, was it number of trees or canopy cover for that eye tree study? It was, I think it was Okay, they looked at the quantity of trees, the actual numbers of estimated numbers of trees in Minneapolis, and then um, applied those, you know, value per tree, if you will. And I believe it also considered um, the size of the trees, not only just the number of trees. Hmm. I guess my last question then is um, how how does the lottery system work and how do we think that's going to improve the equity? Okay, um, the City Trees Program provides um, uh, trees to residents in order to plant on their property. And over the years as they have had this pro um, program, for example, um, oh, maybe three or four years ago when they first um, went to a computer online system, it crashed within a matter of minutes. And so it became a case of the people who were most informed and knew most about the um, uh, availability of these trees, got the trees first. So instead of that, right now, people can apply to get a tree. This happens in the spring. Um, and then so many trees are made available in a lottery, in a, in a random system. However, because most of the trees um, historically were going to the more affluent neighborhoods, particularly in the southwestern part of the city, they decided that they would make sure that, that the top 20 people in the lottery in each ward would get trees before they would give more trees to say um, the wards in the southwestern part of the state. So it's a move towards distributing them more evenly across the city. And what we have been talking to Tree Trust about is since they have this system in place, can they look at the wards or the neighborhoods that have low tree canopy cover or, and or which meet this criteria that the um, Park Board is using of being neighborhoods with more concentrated poverty or higher number of people of color and actually increase, not just make it level, but increase the number of trees that go to that area. So I think the technology exists to do that and so we've had conversations with the tree trusts about doing that and certainly if the city were to encourage them to provide trees first to those higher priority neighborhoods. I think they would be um, amenable to that. So you, so folks would still need to apply then? Yeah, Yeah. for that particular. And that also then begs the question of if there's large numbers of rental property and how do residents who may not you know, own the property but may need or want a tree, what can the city do to help incentivize um, landlords. Um, you know, we know that um, different landlords have different tiers, if you will, in, in the city's system for inspections. And you'll forgive me if I get the words of this wrong. But um, trees, if, if landlords authorize planting of trees and take care of trees on their property, do they get a better rating as far as the city goes? I know there are a lot of people that, that want to get their pet ideas to, to get more incentives um, through rental property, but it's clearly 
a case not only in the Twin Cities, but nationally, that you have greatest problem increasing trees and tree health and tr you know tree growth on rental properties? Thank you for your You're, response. Thank I you, Councilmember Jenkins. Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much, and as always, I appreciate the presentation. I did want to let my colleagues and others know that the um, ordinance having to do with special assessments to get your infected tree removed early and then so that property owners could pay for that um, through their taxes over time um, is um, is done and it's ready and I'm hopefully going to be up for a public hearing this fall still. So we'll have to, we still have to set the public hearing date, but really appreciate um, you bringing it up and hearing your support. I did have a couple questions about some of the other recommendations. I'm assuming that the um, full funding for the uh, the tree coordinator through Public Works then isn't in the mayor's proposed budget, or or do you know if it is? Um, or the park board's budget, maybe? Well, well, it's partly it's intended to be partly funded by the park board, partly funded um, through the Public Works budget. Um, Ralph, do you? I don't know. Um, for sure what, what its status is in the proposed 2020 budget. And, I don't either. And, okay, well, yeah. I'll do some research on that. Um, do we think the Park Board has provided funding for it in their budget? Yes. Okay. Yes, the Park Board is providing right. their portion of the funding, well, no doubt. we can follow up with that, definitely. I also wanted to ask about the tree levy. Was this a tree levy that came from the Park Board? Uh, Ralph, could you or is, what, what, provide answers to that? I mean, I remember it vaguely, but some details would be helpful. Yes, this is the tree preservation and reforestation levy that the Park Board has used to fund the ash canopy replacement plan, uh, and we're in year six of that eight-year plan. So every year that's part of what the Park Board budget includes in addition to the general fund portion of the budget. Okay, so we're fine with that in terms of it's, it's, it's going on for two more years, but you're saying you, we better get ready because we're still going to need it after the um, eight years is over. Yes, correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? All right. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, again, this has been a wonderful conversation and very in-depth. We'll be sure to follow up um, with any additional questions or information that's needed, and um, we look forward to seeing that ordinance. So great. Um, with that, I will move approval of receiving and filing the Minneapolis Tree Advisory Commission 2019 report on the state of the Minneapolis urban forest. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Our last item on today's agenda for discussion is receiving and filing an update report on the Neighborhoods 2020 Framework recommendations. We have Director of NCR, uh, Director David Rubador here to kick us off. Thank you. Right. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham and committee members. Uh, I am David Rubador, the Director of the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department with the City of Minneapolis. And as the Chair has mentioned, I am here to give you an update on the Neighborhoods 2020 work. Um, with some exciting news to present today, as well as an updated timeline um, to let you know how this process will move forward. Um, I am going to be co-presenting today. I have two other presenters with me. Uh, one will be Andre Andre Andrea Larson, excuse me, um, with the City Coordinator's Office, and then also C. Terrence Anderson with the Minnesota uh, University of Minnesota Center for Urban and Regional Affairs. It's been some time since we actually presented to the Peace Committee. It was back in May of this year where we presented some recommendations to the City Council and then the City Council took action later that month um, regarding the framework uh, for Neighborhoods 2020. So today's presentation is really an update about what's happened since then and, and basically how we're going to be moving forward. The actual item before you today is simply a receive and file for the updated work and then also the updated timeline which we'll go through in more detail in just a minute. I think the first thing to start off with though is putting it into the context of the work. Um, I know it's been a little while since we've uh, revisited this, and so I just wanted to start with providing a little bit more context. So neighborhood organizations are a vital part of the city's community and engagement structure, and they have been a core city service for nearly three decades, engaging local communities and understanding local issues and working with the city to create identifying solutions for within their community. Neighborhoods 2020 is a plan for continuing to support neighborhood organizations in Minneapolis and identifying expectations for the work that they do. With the existing community, community participation, uh, excuse me, with the 
when the existing community participation program, which we'll rename to something easier to say, um, ends at the end of uh, 20, uh, 2020, the Neighborhoods 2020 work will result in a new program to carry the vision to preserve our neighborhood organizations and the expectation to create equitable communities where all people are valued, communities are engaged, and leadership mirrors the diversity of our city. Our goal, as stated in the Minneapolis 2040 plan, is that Minneapolis will have an equitable civic participation system that enfranchises everyone, recognizes the core and vital services neighborhood organizations provide the city, and builds people's long-term capacity to organize and improve their lives as well as their neighborhoods. Just to refresh on what the council action was back in May, um, and the city council um, basically took four distinct steps. One was to adopt a framework uh, for the neighborhood's 2020 work. The second was to set into motion a citywide engagement audit and the development of a citywide engagement policy. That work is underway. To support the restructuring of the advisory boards that oversee this work, specifically the Neighborhood Community Engagement Commission and the NRP Policy Board. And then also to direct the hiring of a consultant to assist with the next phase of the neighborhood's 2020 work. Today's action is really regarding item number four, the directing of hiring a consultant. The, the council in the staff directive also outlined a scope of work for the consultant um, to work with the city coordinator's office and then by extension the neighborhood and community relations department. Um, just to highlight a few of the major deliverables that's outlined in the scope, um, one would be the development of the overall program goals and outcomes a racial equity analysis of neighborhood operations and activities, development of a logic model including inputs and outcomes um, that should be expected, convening, convening of neighborhood, uh, excuse me, convening of stakeholders including neighborhood organization, BIPOC communities and other engaged communities in the city, development of program guidelines and the development of accountability measures for the work. Immediately following this council directive, the city coordinator's office was tasked with hiring, um, starting the selection process and hiring the actual um, consultant that would be working on this work. And so I have Andrea Larson here to talk about that process and how that went forward. Good afternoon. Welcome, Ms. Larson. Thank you. Um, so I'll talk through the selection process. In order to find a supplier to meet our deliverables, we ran a competitive process. After consulting the target market program, only two vendors had the qualifications required to complete our scope of work. Per target market program rules, if fewer than three vendors meet the requirements, it is no longer a TMP or target market program purchase and the purchase will follow the regular purchase process and is open to the public. An open process for RFPs was followed. Uh, we had six vendors that submitted proposals and after a thorough review of those vendors, two vendors were identified uh, to move forward into the interview phase. Ultimately, after a couple weeks of deliberation and follow-up questions with both vendors interviewed, we decided that Cura provided the strongest proposal to help us meet our deliverables and scope of work. Among many of Kira's qualifications, they have had direct experience working with neighborhoods, have extensive knowledge and experience with developing work through a racial equity framework, and importantly, are committed through their submitted process to supporting the city and neighborhoods in arriving at an equitable and scalable solution. Great, thank you. Yep. So Chair Cunningham and committee members, the updated timeline, um, you can see on, on, the, on the screen above, uh, through this, uh, first of all, I just wanna say, through the selection process, it was clear that Kira was um, the clear choice to be working with. They not only had the capacity to assist with this work, but as through the conversations, it became very clear that they were gonna be excellent partners with the city and the neighborhoods to complete the work as, as prescribed by the council. So I'm looking forward to working with them, and I just wanted to really clearly state that. In that conversations, we also spent some time really looking at the, at the timeline. It took us longer to get through the selection process than what was originally proposed in the staff directives, and we acknowledge that, but we do think we um, pr um, provided a really thorough process in order to select the, the contractor, which, as Andrea was just talking about a second ago. 
So with that, we also wanted to update the timeline and present that to you today so everybody would have a clear understanding of how we would move forward. So starting right away, the engagement with the various stakeholders, including the advisory boards, the neighborhoods, the, um, the BIPOC communities, as well as others, including the work groups, will begin over um, shortly after this meeting today and the approval by the council. Um, we will likely be doing those in October and November. Deliverables um, uh, that, will, that are expected per the staff directive um, will go as follows. So the racial equity analysis, we expect to have a draft of that done in November. And we do expect to have the draft program guidelines, the logic model, and any recommended adjustments to the framework that was pa passed by the City Council to accomplish those goals would be ready by January of 2020. We're going to open up a comment period um, uh, for at least 45 days um, that would occur in January and February, and we're going to time this over the same time that we're going to be having the Community Connections Conference, which is scheduled for February 1st. So we'll also be holding a number of robust discussions at, at the conference as well. It's our intent to bring back the draft guidelines to the Peace Committee um, here in March of 2020 with the Council approval either in March or April of 2020. We believe this will give enough time to actually go through this process in a way that's going to require an amount of time that we need to spend in the community and working with the various communities that are, that are interested and engaged in this work, as well as being able to present this in, to the council in time to be considered in budget deliberations and the budget process in 2020, and enough time for neighborhoods to still be able to start making adjustments come 2021 when the program would actually go into effect. With that, I'm going to invite uh, C. Terrence Anderson from the university to the, uh, the podium, if I may, um, and he can talk a little bit about the process and how we plan to do the work moving forward. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Anderson. Hi, Mr. Chair, council members. Thanks for having us here today. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about what CARE's thinking about for this Neighborhoods 2020 process. I think the biggest part that I think we had big conversations with, with NCR is about our racial equity framework. Uh, of which I would say there's three different parts. There's sort of the contextualization analysis, the sort of centering the community that are most impacted, and then it's ultimately finding the solutions uh, that get us to where we need to be. And so the beginning of our work really starts with this contextualization analysis. Um, that one starts with increasing the BIPOC representation um, to understand really what's happening um, with neighborhoods um, 2020 right now, or with neighborhood associations in the city of Minneapolis right now. Part of that is about an analyzing uh, past neighborhood investments, other part of it is mapping the represent, representation gap um, for neighborhood boards. So both of those have been centered in the conversation in some way thus far, but haven't really been uh, put forward in terms of how we're moving forward and developing sort of the solutions around here. So I think uh, we really want to do a deep analysis into what's happening with neighborhood associations, both with those two components and kind of more broadly than that. Uh, to some extent, it's going to depend on what data is available. Um, I think there's lots of data that's been, that's been kept since 2000. Um, and so, or maybe even longer, that really hasn't been analyzed. And so we really want to start there to get a clear picture of what's happening, what's not happening with neighborhood associations, um, as well as looking at the representation gap, right? And looking at it more complexly than just whose faces, what, fa what color are those faces on different boards, but really what is the experience uh, more deeply that people are having on those neighborhood boards um, as well. And then uh, I think another thing that's really important uh, around a community-centered approach, uh, Council Member Cunningham, you talked a lot about IEP2 um, at the highest level of doing that work. So the, I think this work isn't just about convening neighborhood associations uh, and the folks who are currently there. It's about convening the broader community um, because these neighborhood associations aren't just for themselves or for the residents uh, of which the area that they occupy. And so we really want to be intentional about convening a group of residents who are not currently part of neighborhood associations and really seeing why aren't they doing that? What might, their experience, what might make their experiences meaningful if they were to participate on it? What would meaningful work for those communities? Um, what would they be doing if neighborhood associations were mindful of what they want in their communities? Um, as well as, you know, not all neighborhood associations are the same place. There are good actors. There are good neighborhood associations. And so of the best of them, what are they doing? What did their transformation look like? Um, what can other neighborhood associations learn from those groups and center into ultimately what the framework and guidelines become long term, I think is really important as well. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, our goal is about assisting NCR uh, in the city of Minneapolis as well as the neighborhood association 
um, to mutually implement a plan that they both believe in. I think if you're talking about any particular policy and you have one group who's uh, sort of holding accountability and administering it and another group who's responsible for implementing it and they disagree, that's not the ideal situation that we want to be in. And so. Uh, convening a process that ultimately builds trust and accountability between uh, these two uh, major groups of actors, or three if you're including residents that are not currently part of neighborhood associations, is sort of a core goal in our engagement work that we're going to be doing. Um, Kira, we're going to step away. Our relationships, uh, of course, will remain, but it's not about our relationships with those neighborhood associations. It's about um, for NCR and the neighborhood associations going forward. That's um, important for us. Um, so, and, and uh, the last piece that I really want to talk about is sort of how we're thinking about funding these groups. It has been a major source of contention up to this point, and so we certainly don't intend to run away from that conversation in, in the context of the work that we're doing, but really sort of uh, more complexly understand what are the needs of these neighborhood associations. How can we sort of structure a plan, uh, not just in the context of the city's resources, but perhaps beyond that allow them to be the full-fledged um, organizations that they want to be for their neighborhoods or what we hope they can be um, from our perspective. Um, so really, you know, our next uh, steps are really around convening, am I supposed to be going over this slide? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, convene the internal steering committee, so that's the group that's gonna really help guide um, this work. Uh, I think really needs to be fleshed out exactly what that group will be, which will really preempt doing that con contextualization analysis, so getting that big data dump. Uh, we'll probably do some sort of um, survey administration to these groups as well to find some things that data currently doesn't tell us, uh, convene that leadership uh, of BIPOC folks around, uh, around Minneapolis, and then um, those stakeholder convenings as prescribed in, um, in, in what was prescribed by the council. So uh, we have some big work, um, maybe some long days in the next couple of months, but I think uh, Kira thinks that this work is important. We've, we've sort of stated that Neighborhoods, uh, our resi neighborhood residents are the most powerful force for justice in their communities, and so that takes long hours to really sort of get to, then I think we're committed to doing that um, to sort of set aside other pieces of our work to make ourselves available to do this. So, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Mr. Rubador, do you have more to add? No, I, right. I, I was just gonna say that concludes our presentation. So. All right. Great, thank you so much. Um, I have a question or comment from Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Cunningham and uh, Mr. Rubador and uh, Ms. Larson and Mr. Anderson. I, I guess my question is, um, in the process, it does sound like a lot of work. Um, I mean, going back to 2000, that's almost 20 years of data. Um, but I'm curious, is there conversation around what is the neighborhood association's role to the city? I mean, I hear a lot of talk about their role to the neighborhood, mm -hmm. but to the city enterprise, is that a part of the conversation? Chair Cunningham and uh, uh, Council Vice President Jenkins, uh, yes it is. And actually, we kind of went over quickly the process moving forward, but one of the core elements here is that there will be an internal steering committee that was established in the staff directive, which includes three council members uh, led by uh, um, the committee chair, um, uh, Cunningham, as well as the city coordinator, the CFO, myself, um, and it, as, uh, um, uh, C. Terrence was mentioning, and we can look at who else needs to be at the table there, but that is part of that conversation is both what's, how we support the work at the neighborhoods, but then also what that relationship and that expectation is with the city. That's where that conversation will occur, and then transition into the neighborhood conversations as well. Yeah, and I think that's a really important aspect because that was seemingly the most contentious part of the conversation. Uh, Chair Cunningham and uh, um, Council um, Vice President Jenkins, the, yes, I, I would say that there's a couple points that were pretty contentious, I think, in the, in the original pr uh, presentation. One was around the funding, but also the relationship with the city is a, is a core element, and people understanding what that expectation is, um, and um, um, both from the city, understanding what the expectation is that we have with neighborhoods, but also what neighborhoods have of the city. I think those are both in there. 
And in that conversation had to do with everything with the service delivery from, from uh, NCR to expectations around development, to expectations around different issues that neighborhoods are having. So we, we will be discussing that. And again, I think the steering committee is where a lot of those kind of relational conversations will occur. But um, um, it's a lot to cover. Uh, but that's, yes, those need to be addressed, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will uh, jump in here to say um, how excited I am for this partnership. Um, I think that it's really, uh, this is a lot of work to get done, and but it's really important work. Uh, neighborhood associations are a legacy that are still in motion, and we want to make sure that we continue and evolve and grow that legacy to be able to reflect the shifting demographics of our city, to be able to meet the needs, to actually be an extension of the values that we all share here at the city of equity, um, community voice, civic participation. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see the, the work that comes out of this partnership. Um, it was a challenging conversation, um, you know, from some aspects it was contentious, but from some other as you know perspectives it could be we were having a challenging conversation and the, uh, I think that what we really pulled out of that is how do we do this work in a, in a new collaborative, thoughtful way um, to be able to build neighborhood associations uh, for the present and the future to actually meet the needs of neighborhood residents. We, I think what we, my hypothesis is as we look into the data, we'll see that a lot of the money historically has been invested in white homeowners in the, in the neighborhoods. Um, and so how can we change that? How do we change, how can we as the city help support neighborhood associations to be able to do that, um, to be able to better meet the needs of residents who are renters, people of color, indigenous folks. And so, um, so I'm very, very grateful for this. Um, this update has been very informative um, and has gotten me excited about the work ahead. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Gordon. I just appreciate the report. We appreciate the update. Um, it's great to see that now we kind of have a team assembled and we're ready to move forward. So I appreciate it and I understand the adjusted timeline. I think the fact that we have um, a funding plan for the future is really going to help us as we're going forward. So I'm really grateful that we were able to approve that framework, but now that we're also going to do some more work as we flesh out the next steps. So um, welcome and I look forward to uh, seeing your work as we move forward. Thank you so much. All right, seeing no further questions, thank you to the awesome trio for all of your work and for this presentation today. Uh, I will move approval of receiving and filing the update report on Neighborhoods 2020 Framework recommendations. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Thank you all so much all of your hard work today um, and seeing no further business before the committee, we are adjourned.